Hello, friends. Welcome to the Cup of Nurses podcast with your hosts, Matt Slarczyk and Peter Fendero. What's up, guys? How you guys doing? This is a podcast where we tackle hot news and nursing topics, one conversation at a time. How you doing today, Petey? I'm doing good. I feel, I mean, it's, it snowed. I went to get a burrito yesterday in the snow because I want to pay for Uber Eats, but it was a good burrito. It's been I, like, I, I can't have burritos late at night, man. It's going to clog up my stomach. Yeah, I mean, I ate, I ate them all the time. Well, before midnight, anything before midnight, we're good. Because I usually don't go to bed till like maybe 1 30, 2 o'clock. So I, my tummy settles. Tummy settles. That's what night shift happens. We have um, odd schedules. But guys, those that are new, welcome. Thank you for listening. You guys are going to have an awesome time on this show. Please subscribe. Those that are returning, thank you. We have about over 3,000 listeners a month and not enough five stars, guys. So please head over to whatever app you're using, smash that five star, leave us an awesome review. It's going to motivate us to keep hustling, keep doing this podcast. And ultimately it's going to rank us better. So we're more visible on the internet. Don't forget to check us out on YouTube. If you guys want to see how we look, Matt's looking, looking nice, extra sharp. Looks like he had a nice shave. Looks like a real, real gentleman today. So if you guys want to see how it looks, check us on YouTube. A couple of nurses. <laughs> what are we talking about today, PD? On today's episode, we're going to talk about how to get past your cold and flu. Cold and flu is on the rise in this January month. And also the health news for today is going to be, we're going to talk about the de-implementation of traditional based practices. So as research moves forward, some of the traditional ways nurses did things are now shown to be disproved and evidence shows that they are more harmful than good. And we're going to talk about three interesting topics that basically has moved away from healthcare and it's not evidence-based as much. And what I'm starting to notice too, as well as, I don't know if your facility does this, but the, the, the facility when I was in Chicago doesn't do this, but the peripheral IVs here in the hospitals, they do chlorohexidine or chlorobio patches for everything. Do you guys do that as well for the IVs? No, n- not for peripheral ones. For peripheral ones, we just do the regular uh, tegaderm and no kind of bio patch or any kind of, kind of, um, I don't know, antimicrobial thing. I know for our, now we are for our central dressings, we used to have the bio patches and we're doing it mostly for the bloom pump sites. Is it the bio patch? It's like a gel portion of the tegaderm is like a gel. It's like an antimicrobial gel. I'm not sure if you've seen those or not. I have not seen those. I just know about the IV ones here in um, the Kaiser location. Maybe I'll bring one and I'll show you guys one. I got I to borrow it, borrow it from work. Yeah, back in the day when we were recording a podcast, I know I wanted to put an NG2 down Peter's nose. So I feel like that's still up in debate. When I come back in Chicago, I think we should do it, man. Live on cam. Maybe. I mean, I'm down. I mean, it's cool. I don't got to chew my food anymore. You just mix it up and just push in my stomach. You know, those those damn shakes, those veggie shakes that you, that you make. The, oh, the juices, the juices. You know, the juices, that, they're very healthy, but they don't taste very good. So you just put it through the NG. You know, just, you know, just keeping it for the whole month. Maybe I'm going to work with it. With a little dub huff. Don't worry, guys. It's x-ray verified. <laughs> but but I'm going to make sure I'm going to sign a piece of paper because I don't want you to in a month say, hey, you know what, Matt, since I did this, let me stick a Foley in your you know whole orifice. I mean, I'll do a flexi. I got you on a flexi. I'm, I'm pretty good at those. I've, I've been putting a lot of flexes in lately. I've, I can definitely get one in you. And that's cool. I'll, I'll get you both. Uh, not a, I'll get you a Foley and a flex. That way you can just shed and piss at the same time. You just keep watching TV. We'll get you an NG as well. You just You just sit there, you know. A living room, don't got to worry about going to the bathroom. Don't got to worry about eating. I'll just, I'll just feed you and you can just, you know, poop and pee at the same time. And this is a perfect episode about it because we're talking about how to get past your cold and flu. Just sit there with all the little tubes and drains, man. And it's funny that you bring up Flexaseal. Those that don't know, it's a, um, it's a device that you plug up the butthole and basically it allows you to drain diarrhea. Um, there was two nurses that were doing it back in my old facility and they did it with the donut inflamed or in inflated so for those that don't know in order to put it up the the butt you basically have to lubricate it and you you shouldn't be putting water into it already because it's a balloon that makes prevents it from getting pulled and they were doing it with the balloon inflated man <laughs> were they able to get it in i mean that would be hard so you could do it with the balloon inflated unless someone's got a really really wide alley i don't know there was a poor poor soul that did that man but i think a nurse brought it up and they deflated and they put it in properly but one of those rookie mistakes. Exactly. There's always rookie mistakes happening. 
So do you want to go over the first one here? So we have bath basins. Uh, bath basins were something that nurses used back in the day. I personally have maybe done a one bed bath or two like that, but it's going away because it's not evidence-based anymore where it's harmful for bacteria growth. It's harmful for the immunocompromised patients and it allows you to basically spread infection a lot more. So what the hospitals do now is anybody that has a central line or anybody that comes into the ICU and usually anybody that we wipe down, we do um, chlorhexidine wipes, which is antimicrobial. Even though it says it's 99.9% .9 effective, it only technically lasts six hours. So it's not even like that antimicrobial, but it's still more evidence-based than the, the bath basins. There's a, there's like a handful of nurses I talked to. They're they're like you know, back in the day we used to get a basin with with soap and water, and that's how we used to wash our patients instead of these these wipes. I preferred the wipes. I think the wipes are are a lot more convenient. And I've I mean for sure. I mean evidence even shows that you know it's with these bath basins they tend to harbor harbor bacteria. I mean who knows if you wash the basin properly, maybe you you like missed a little edge, and now the whole thing is contaminated. And some of these patients, when we come in, they're, they're very dirty. And these obviously basins get, get reused. So imagine, you know, washing somebody up and then later on that same day, you know, you're washing their butt and then now you're rinsing out the basin again, cleaning it and now you're using, using it for their, their chest and their central line. So I'm completely for this. I would, I would not, you know, want to use a, a bath basin. The only time we do use a bath basin on our unit is if someone's going to a surgery, like pre-op where you got to do the, the HIPAA cleanse bath where you got to do the two baths before they go to surgery. Yeah. One usually, uh, one we do early on in the evening and then one maybe a few hours before surgery. And those, we just kind of get them in a bottle and then we, we get a brand new basin with washcloth, with washcloths, and then we just pour the liquid in, in the basin and we just scrub the whole whole body with it. But I cannot see myself doing that every single time for a bath. I, I prefer those chlorhexidine wipes. And you get like, what, eight of them and now, and then, you're not really spreading anything because you you got like six or eight of them and you wait, wash up the arm, throw it out, take another one, wash the other arm, throw it out, wash the chest, throw it out, and you keep getting getting a new a, a new horochlorexidine, the little paper cloth thing. Plus, like as a nurse, like dude, I don't got time to be bathing a whole damn patient, a whole you know like bunch of wipes, wiping it down. And there's nurses that do that, and power to them. But these chlorhexidine wipes are honestly just more efficient when it comes to just getting your job done. To be honest. And if they're more um, effective when it comes to fighting infection, I'm all for it. And plus, they're, they're they're warm. We put them in the warmer. It's not like they're, they're they're cold. I'm not sure if you guys have a like a warmer for those. Do you? We do. And usually, I I see it more in the ICU. Sometimes I go on the floor and I'm just grabbing just a packet without being warmed up. Yeah, I just try to warm it up. We have a pretty we have a pretty good good, good size warmer, so we got a bunch in there. Uh, the next one, guys, is checking residuals. So if a patient has an NG tube or a G tube. Uh, the research here was talking more about patients with with NGs. So residual is where you confirm placement of the NG tube and you make sure it's in the right place. And then what you do is you suck out any kind of gastric contents that are that are there. And what nurses used to do back in the day, judging on how much uh, contents they, they aspirated, that would tell them to maybe stop the, the tube feed or would tell them to, you know, maybe slow, slow it down. And that, that's shown to be false because... One of the another one of the reasons was for checking GI contents by aspirating is is that if you had a lot of it, then that could be shown as at risk for aspiration. And according to the results, there is no increased risk for aspiration depending on how much GI contract con, GI um, stuff you have in your in your stomach. I guess so. Just because you have a lot of stuff in your stomach doesn't necessarily mean you're going to aspirate. Actually, research shows that has there hasn't been any kind of really cases unless your stomach is completely overfilled, but that would show by the, by like a distended abdomen more than the, the aspiration of contents. Yeah. I feel like some nurses like they, and I did it too. Like you, you check a residual and there's like 300 in there and right away we like freak out, like there's a lot and we end up like dumping some of it or half of it. And what happens is we start like disrupting like the pH balances of our, of our stomach. Right. The research was showing that by nurses aspirating they're First of all, it takes time. So it takes up a lot of nurses time to aspirate. And then they're misjudging the amount of content there actually is. And they're stopping these tube feeds at inappropriate times. And like you said, they're also messing with the pH if you're if you getting rid of some. So current practice, the current best practices are telling us not to aspirate and not to, um, not to check residuals unless you see like a giant, um, like a giant abdomen where it's like bloated and, and distended. 
you know, at that point, yeah, that's probably a good time. But if you're doing every shift, there's really no scientific evidence saying that's any kind of benefit. There's also a policy in Kaiser that basically that says that you don't have to put your two feedings on a hold when you're laying the patient flat. So that's something that they just implemented. And I was talking to a nurse about it. I should pull it up to, to see what the research is showing. But the, they're just saying that you're not likely to aspirate when you're laying flat like that. Even if they're intubated on two feeds, you don't have to technically do it. Interesting, because I've always been taught to, you know, hold your tube feeds when you're laying somebody flat and when you're turning them. But there's like the esophageal sphincters there, right? I'm, sh I'm sure that protects the person from aspirating, right? Like logically speaking? Logically, yeah. But you also, if you have like an NG or an OG, then technically that's open. I'm not too sure, but I think as we're moving and, you know, you've been only a nurse for three years, like you're going to start realizing things and technology is moving so quick you're gonna to have to be switching your ways so much quicker than these newer nurses that had the same implementation for let's just say 10 15 years or else it might be every two years something because you know we have to switch our practice so it's crazy how science is moving so much quicker than they used to back in the day it's pretty interesting to see what we're gonna tell future nurses like back in the day we used to do this because we all meet those nurses that have been doing it for for 20 10, 20, 30 years that always tell stories like how this has changed. I wonder what, what we're going to tell our, you know, the future nurses of how we used to do things and how things changed. Do you think we'll be a bunch of Debbie Downers and complainers? Like, oh man, this sucked. Probably. I'm sure, I'm sure some things are, are going to happen. Like, like it sucked because for, because we're talking about the, the washing of the patient with the chloroxide wipes. We actually, in our hospital or in our unit, I'm not sure it's hospital wide or, or just for our unit, but we actually got to wash our patients every shift. So patient gets gets two baths instead of just one. Okay, that's something I wasn't familiar with. And that's a pain in the ass. But you know, like it. I guess the studies have shown that that you know promotes or decreases the incidence of those of collapses and, and colitis or whatever. So I guess so we're doing that every shift now. And I feel like you have a very specific unit where you have LVADs. You have a lot more like lines and tubes in your unit. So I see why they're pushing for that for twice a shift. And I, I'm all for it, man. Yeah. And while on dressings, I guess the next one is uh, back in the day, I guess they used to do occlusive dressing for, for chest tubes. I have never personally seen an occlusive dressing on a chest tube. What, what our unit does is we just do the split gauze with uh, surgical tape. That's how they come out of surgery. They don't come out of surgery with an occlusive dressing on a chest tube. Back in the day, uh, nurses thought, and, and even physicians thought that having occlusive dressing was very important in preventing the pleural cavity to get air from the, the outside world. But what actually happened is that we know how tape works on, our, on, our, on skin. We move around and that tape already kind of moves a little bit or it has some openings because our skin is very, very, very flexible and it can move. So the research was showing that even when you put a, a occlusive dressing on, just the fact that the way our skin is and our way our body works is that it's still porous. Like the tape might be occlusive for a little bit, but then when the patient starts moving, it becomes unocclusive. So it really has, has no point in being occlusive because it doesn't even work. And it was actually shown that the foam tape that people were using to cover these occlusive dressings was actually detrimental to people's skin because when they would take it off, it would cause skin tears because it was so, so sticky to the patient's skin. And you're talking about like uh, tapes and dressings. I have had a few patients out here that their skin is so sensitive and fragile, or we couldn't use the regular tapes. Even the paper tape was too much for her. And that's like the weakest kind of tape that we use. I had to literally grab like um, the alcohol pads that are like, you know, the barrier skin ones to kind of remove tape. And I and then she and her skin was still getting removed. She was very, very sensitive. Plus, with um, the overuse of steroids nowadays, people put steroid creams and without even realizing it makes their skin paper thin. My example, my grandma. And just in general, all this inflammation, like our skins are very sensitive to these tapes. So that's something we should consider as nurses when we apply different tapes on patients. Especially like the older population, like they, they, these poor little grandmas have such thin skin where they just hit their elbow, like gently nick the, the siren and, and they're bleeding. And it's just like, damn, and, now, and they're plus anticoagulated. And now there's like, there's so much blood. Like, why would you want to put, you know, foam tape on their, their chest or the abdomen, or whatever that that uh, that tubes come out of it's is going to be you know that's going to lead to a higher bleeding and that's going to lead to an infection because now you got to worry about the skin tear and sometimes when you're you know giving a report like you're not even telling each other the skin tears 
and then you're like assessing the patient you see like a bunch of foams all over the arm or like dressings and you're just peeling it back you're like yeah this lady just got her like bunch of skin tears skin completely off or if you're removing an iv some people aren't gentle they just rip it out right with the skin so yeah definitely considerations that we should consider poor like grandmas if you guys want to read up on any of this information we did get these three um, the implementation of best practices from actually the critical care journal it's volume 39 it was a december 2019 edition it's pages 64 to 69 or you can check out our show notes i have the link over there with the or actually the description of it both work very well since we're advertising here oh, oh you hear that the yeah, police that? something's going on right there man i think this one's car alarm i think you should go check your um check your windows and make sure no one's robbing you but anyway since we're on the topic here Patreon, guys, it's something that we're doing, which is something new. If you want more exclusive content, us being able to swear on the show, us telling us more personal stories, we're going to start a Patreon, and that's going to be available soon. So just a heads up for that. And we're doing something called the After Hours, where we kind of just talk about who knows what, guys. You guys have to find out. We do, unfortunately, limit ourselves here on this Couple Nurses podcast because we can't say everything that's on our mind and if you guys want to get us a know a little, little bit more check out us on patreon like like matt said we kind of just tell stories about how our, how our day has been how the new stuff we've seen online just things we're, we're doing with our lives it's kind of you get to meet more of our personalities on, on patreon and um, the people that are going to subscribe as well we're going to start getting the people on just communicating with them getting them onto the actual show and just chatting so stay tuned for that one so let's talk about how to get healthy when you're sick. And I feel like we have like this regimen, we know what to do. And me and Petey just got recently sick. So that's why we, we thought about making this episode like this because we know what happened and we know how we felt and we know what actually worked. And one thing I wish I would have done is stay home from work. But I had this, um, I went to Chicago for the week. I flew in and I had absolutely no days and I can't take days off as a traveling nurse. So I had to actually come into work. But number one for those, you need your sleep. That's the best form of self-love. Get your damn sleep. Take your PTO if you can. And just sacrifice that one day because it's going to make that much of a difference. I highly recommend staying home. I wish I stayed home, but the stubborn nurse that I am, I did go into work. But you got to think about what kind of population did you work with? If you work with infants, work with kids, you should be more inclined to stay home because they are a high risk population. You know, these, these kids are still developing their immune systems and they can't fight off infection as, as strong as, as, or as well as our, our immune systems can, especially if you're in a NICU, you have these little poor little babies that cannot get sick. So you should definitely stay at home. Or I mean, if you do come into work, you should probably have a lighter assignment if possible. Me being stubborn nurse, me being a stubborn nurse that I am, I don't want to use my PTO on a sick day. I ready to stick it out. And my PTO days are for, my self-love and my self-love is me going on vacation or, or doing things besides sitting at home and, and, and being sick. But if you decide to go into work, you should definitely wear a mask all day and every day that, that you are sick because you don't want to get your coworkers sick because then, you know, you might be short staff and you don't want to get your patients sick. Like I said, they're in a hospital, so they're already immunocompromised, especially if you're working with these, with these little, little people, these kids, these children, you don't want to get them sick. And especially, be mindful of people that have heart transplants or immunocompromised, like people that have HIV or certain illnesses that make them more inclined to getting these infections. And also those poor little grandmas that Peter Peter um, mentioned. I know you love those poor little grandmas, Peter. Um, another thing is that mask that you're going to put on. I think I've noticed that when I was sick, I was literally sneezing in that mask. My eyes were watery as hell. That's the one thing that sucked is like, plus you have like post nasal drip all the time in that mask and it's just like covered on your face and it like, it's nasty, man. I, I hate being sick at work. And remember, you're like, when you are sick, you're not at your optimal, you're not at, at your, at your optimum capabilities. So if you can try to adjust your, your set or your patients, because you're not going to be a top of your A game, unfortunately, you don't want to have the sickest patient on the unit because you might miss a few things. So just be mindful of that guys. And one of those things is like memory is like you're so overwhelmed, especially when you're sick, you handle stress a lot worse. You just forget things like I was running back and forth, um, forgetting tubing, forgetting like a flush bag. I was forgetting medication. Sometimes I, took, I, I did a lot of back and forth pacing, which which only added stress onto me already being not on my A game, as you say. Right. So for all you stubborn nurses out there, you decided to go to work. So now what? 
Now what can you do? You can't sleep because you're at work. So what are your next best options? First one is probably going to be get some soup. Soup is very good for you because it's high in calories. It's, it's calorie dense. And most of the time when you're sick, you probably have a, like a sore throat or you just don't have an appetite. Soup is something easy, easy to eat. It's a liquid. It's easy to swallow. And plus you have some veggies in there and a lot of nu- no, nutritional value. And it's a decongestant. So if you're not hungry or let's say if you don't have any kind of taste for food, you can at least try to get some soup down, get some kind of vitamins in you. D- definitely eating, having a healthy diet. That's important because you have to give those nutrients into the body that it's it's lacking. And it's what it's it's going to create more efficiency to you fighting off the infection. I, on the other hand, I did the complete counter counteractive move here. And I'm going to be honest here is I was sick and I ordered a damn pizza, but that's not, that's not helping my body fight off the infection. I have noticed that it made me more sluggish. So definitely get, get something with like vitamin C. And if not that take those vitamin C packets, those are actually nice and jam packed with um, like B12s and things like that to help you be energized. I personally take like, Four to five thousand milligrams. And vitamin C, it's it's what you gotta remember. It's water soluble, so it's not not fat soluble. Like vitamin A, like people could overdose on vitamin A. Like certain kids die from from overdose of vitamin A. Vitamin C is water soluble, so whatever your body does, does not use, you're gonna either pee out or or poop out. If you consume a high amount of vitamin C, I guess probably the worst thing's gonna happen to you is probably diarrhea. It does give you the runs and a Gatorade look in your end. But like Matt said, if you if you're if you're sick, you should definitely get those vitamin C packets. I have a box of them at home. So whenever I'm sick, I just you know drink a bunch of them. Or even when I'm when I'm not sick, I just kind of drink them anyway, just to you know get my immune system a little a little boost. Like I say, it's cold outside, and I don't want to get sick. I would just you know um, throw some extra vitamin C. And some people take those packets daily when it's winter, and some people don't know that just because you're taking a thousand milligrams of vitamin C doesn't mean your your body's actually taking in that thousand because there's something called bioavailability. Like your vitamin C is co- going through your stomach. It's going through the gastric acids. It's getting absorbed through the intestines. By the time it's actually reaching your body, it might be at like 70 to 75% bioavailability. And I'm making up those numbers. But if you um, if you want to step up your game when it comes to vitamin C, you could take something called liposomal vitamin C, which is, it makes a barrier around. I wish I could just like show someone an image in their in their mind. But it's basically imagine your vitamin C is a molecule and you have like this shield of um, lipids around it. And what happens is it passes through the stomach without being um, destroyed. And I think they say it's like 97% plus bioavailable. Yeah, just imagine like a, like a capsule surrounding like some kind of a powder. It's it's the, the same the same basis. It makes it available in your body to use instead of getting broken up and, and destroyed. But for you guys that want the natural route of vitamin C, you could just take some lemon sort that in, in your water. Even garlic is, is high vitamin C as well. You put that in your in your soup for all the people that don't like to take like, you know, packets of vitamin C or pills of vitamin C. And I and I do something called the called the, the G bomb. So I think there's something called greens, blueberries, it's like antioxidants, onions, mushrooms, uh, foods that are very high in like antioxidants and fight off infections. I try to get those in as I'm sick. So I'll make like eggs with garlic if I can with mushrooms, with onions, all those like healthy, healthy um, foods that like boost your immunity. I try to do that when I'm sick as well. Yeah, there you go, go guys. But the key thing to get out of here is just, you know, eat something, get your vitamin C. The next one is definitely medication. Like, there's plenty of over-the-counter medications. We know that the cold and flu is not curable with any kind of meds. You can't go to a doctor and get like an antiviral and get, you know, rid of the flu. So your best bet is to just get medication that'll help you with the, with the symptoms. I use Tylenol AM and PM, and those things were, were perfect. The AM, you know, kept me awake at work, and the PM knocked me off like a, like 12 hours. I'm not sure you guys checked out the Instagram of like a few weeks ago or a few days ago, but yeah, definitely Tylenol PM knocked me out so quick when I couldn't sleep, and that did wonders. But the thing that people um, forget to, or thing that people don't really know about is that Tylenol AM, it contains something called phenylephrine. And it's actually in a hospital we use as like a vasopressor, increases your blood pressure when your blood pressure is super low. But they have a minute amount in the Italian AM, which kind of helps you to stay awake. But it's also a vasoconstrictor. That's where the decongestion aspect comes into play because when you're sick, your nasal passages, nasal cavities, and vessels in your, in your in your nose are inflamed. So they're they're they're, they're big. And what this often does is actually constricts them, makes them smaller, so you don't have as much congestion going on in your nose. So Tylenol AM is a couple of nurses approved medication for when you're sick. 
I like it, man. Dude, I think thing worked. Like I don't usually take medications, but I was I was so sick. I was like, dude, I, I can't sleep. I'm just gonna take this PM. I did the PM, did its job, and I'm like, damn, if the PM worked this well, let me see what the AM does. And the AM did just as good. Okay. Something to consider for next time. I usually get sick like once a year, like really, really severe. And it happened in January. I didn't have anything at home when I landed in San Diego. So I was kind of like short on options. I just did vitamin C, a bunch of tea. Honey, of course, is another great one. I don't know if we're going to mention it, but honey has a lot of benefits when it comes to immunity. Not exactly sure why I didn't do my research. And also, I just did um, ibuprofen, man. I just had a killer headache. I just took like 400 milligrams, maybe like twice throughout the day, just to kind of help me at work as well. There you go. With, with the honey, it's honey is a natural antibacterial, which won't really have like any kind of antibacterial effects with, with the flu. But like honey helps to soothe a, a sore throat. Like honey actually helps with this, helps me with a sore throat. I usually take a spoon of honey and I feel better. And even for like, for like allergies, what, sometimes I get allergies occasionally in like the springtime. Well, that's why I found out from my mom, actually. My mom told me to take a tablespoon of honey like throughout winter and you won't have allergies, you know, the coming, the coming spring. And I was like, yeah, whatever, whatever. I tried it and it, it does work. Like the pollen inside actually helps you to become immune to certain pollens during the, uh, the springtime. Because yeah, it, so because the honey, the honey contains you know, these pollens that grow in the spring and you're already used to them. So you're not going to get as much allergies. Yeah. It's like your body, honey basically is training your body and it's developing those antigens not to be so reactive to exactly when springtime comes and the hay fever, it doesn't react as much because bees pollinate and it has those antigens. It's pretty cool. It is actually really, really cool. Uh, it's a lot of uh, hidden benefits. And even if you think about it, have you ever put um, honey on, on wounds in your hospital? They have those dressings and they actually help heal. I've, I've done a few of them for like uh, burns, especially yeah. burns. Yeah. Is, is that kind of cool? Like, you, like for us, it's not... It's not like a dry sink. It's like a, a little, I guess it's like, it's like a little plastic jar where you scoop it out and you put it on like the wound and you put a dress, dressing over it. I forgot. Oh yeah. What I was going to say is, whoa, see it? Well, my, my power was, it looks like my power was one now, like flashed. But, um, so what I was going to say is like, th- like this year, I've seen a lot of people with, with flu. Like when I, go to a, when I go to a store, I see a lot of people with the sniffles or coughing, sneezing, runny nose. And I actually, I'm on Google News. It was saying that there's a high incidence of, of flu, I think, in Illinois. I don't know if it was in like Google News or some kind of a news station. And they're saying that this is one of the worst flus that has hit Illinois in a while. Interesting. And I wonder if I, because I, I was there for the week and I came here and I became sick. So I wonder if I actually caught something back in Illinois. So guys, we're listening from Illinois. So just be on a watch out if you're, if you're not sick. Um, just be careful, probably follow our regimen here of eat, eating healthy and taking some vitamin C because you don't want to get sick. And the more people around you are sick, then guess what? You might you might get sick too. I wonder if it has anything to do with the legalization of marijuana, but that might be a conspiracy for the after hours. Maybe everyone's, maybe everyone's sharing blunts and bowls here. And they've just spiked up the flu season for you guys. What's the next one that we could do? When you're sick, you should probably go home and get some sleep and... The reason being is I'm even checking my app as a night shift nurse and I'm not getting enough sleep. Like I think my sleep recovery on this whoop band I'm trying is only 47%. And it's telling me to catch up to optimal recovery. I need 12 hours and 47 minutes of sleep. Who has time for that? Uh, that's that's half the day, man. That's, boring. that's half the day. Who sleeps for that long? You're crazy. Like a, like a bear. It's winter time. You're going to hibernate. But I wonder if I actually sleep in that 12 and give my body that. I wonder how I'm going to wake up and feel. Because sometimes I, I tell myself, man, I'm just being forgetful. I'm, it's just me. It's me. But it's like maybe I just need some damn sleep, Matt. Maybe you're just too sleep deprived because I just – I sacrifice sleep for everything, man. I really do. But can you really sleep for 12 hours? Like are you, would you be able to sleep from 6 to 6 without, without waking up or without having to get up and do something? Of course not because I just have like these – I'm always like, I don't want to say a go-getter, but I have this mentality. I don't know if who is it who is it from, but I'm just like always trying to be in gear, always in motion. And if I'm just sitting down doing something, sometimes that bothers me. Yeah. Yeah, guys. Well, you should try to get, get your sleep. So I actually looked at a study. It was a study done. It wasn't done on, on humans. It was done with like the, the petri dishes and just more looking at, at cells and how they work. And this study actually showed that 
when you sleep, you have a decrease in certain hormones that actually make your T cells stickier. So that with the with that benefit is that they could better stick to whatever bacteria or, or virus is going going through your body. So that's how sleep promotion actually helps you get better is by kind of ramping up your immune system, your, your T cells, and having them be better off to fight off infections. And, and it's kind of funny because we're talking about being sick and the right before I got sick, I was sleeping like four to five hours a day. I had a binger of alcohol, right? I flew in, everybody's having fun, buddy's birthday, and I drank like two or three days in a row and it's New Year's. I didn't sleep. It was a perfect combination of being immunocompromised. And I mean, I just, and I was so sick. Like I was shaking. I was, I woke up sweating one time. I got, I woke up, I was so sweaty. I literally just went to go wash all my sheets. I'm like that, man, you just freaking got drenched last night. Oh, for sure. Yeah. When you flew it, I'm sure you probably wanted to see everybody. So you probably weren't eating as health, healthy as you normally would. And I thought lack on sleep on, on top of that. And I'm sure you were having high doses of vitamin C. You, you mean, and your plus you probably were properly dressed coming from California, you probably didn't have any winter or the proper winter attire. And then you're, you're drinking. That's just, you're just asking for it at that point. I'm glad right. you got sick. Maybe you learned your lesson. I did learn my lesson. And it's funny because they always say like, don't go outside when you're, you know, when you're warm and you're sweaty and you don't realize that, Hey, I just danced like for a couple hours. You got, you get out of the bar, nice and cold, especially it was like really cold. It was in the twenties. Right. And it just hits you, but it's okay. It's, you know, we're all, we all make mistakes and we're not perfect here. Just to let you guys know we're just human, but we talk about the proper way to do things, but we don't always follow it as the way we should. Right. That's correct. So guys, in this episode, we talked about the de-implementation of certain best practices that were done back in the day. Those were bath basins, occlusive dressing for chest tubes, and then it was the third one. What was the third one, Matt? Occlusive chest tube dressings. No, the other one. Gastric residual volume. Gas residual volume. There you go. And then for you guys that are sick and refuse to stay home, so you push it and go to work, remember to eat a healthy diet, take in some vitamin C. And when you guys get home, remember to go to sleep and get your rest. And if you guys know something that's being changed, that's not evidence-based anymore in your hospital, drop a comment. Let us know on social media. We're down to talk about it. So, guys, we'll see you guys next week.